Hi everybody, Ryan Jackson here. Hope you're doing well. We're going to talk about equipment grounding and bonding in patient care spaces, specifically section 517.13. I got an email from somebody asking if I would uh, cover the subject, and it sounded like a fun topic to talk about. So uh, we're going to do kind of a deep dive into that section, and it's going to be based on the 2020 version of the NEC. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so let's start with the scope of Article 517. Uh, it's always worth reading the scope of the article that you're going to be learning about. So 517.1, this article covers facilities that provide health care for human beings. All right, so there you go, health care facilities. Um, it doesn't really tell us what a health care facility is in the scope of Article 517, but it does that in the next section, 517.2 definitions. It tells us that a health care facility is a building or a portion of a building, or even a mobile enclosure, in which human medical, dental, psychiatric, nursing, obstetrical, or surgical care are provided. So a healthcare facility is, is pretty much what you think it would be, somewhere where there's doctors and nurses, you know, you have dental, uh, psychiatric. So some of, the, uh, some of the types of care that are covered might not uh, jump into your mind immediately, so things like psychiatric care, for example, are health care facilities. And we're going to talk about that specifically as it relates to, uh, to grounding and bonding in patient, patient care spaces because there was a nice change made in the 2020 version. Um, they did mention in the scope and in that definition both that this is only for humans. So if you're wiring a veterinary clinic, for example, you would not be reading Article 517. Uh, of course, the NEC covers veterinary clinics, but it doesn't have any special rules for them. You wouldn't wire a veterinary clinic any different than you would an office building as far as the NEC is concerned. There's an informational note that says examples of healthcare facilities include hospitals, obviously, uh, nursing homes and limited care facilities, clinics, medical or dental offices, as well as ambulatory care centers. So it does include dental care as well. Now, if we go forward a couple of pages, we're going to find ourselves in part two of Article 517, which is patient care spaces. And that's where we're going to spend most of the discussion today. But before we get there, 517.10 sort of lays out a scope for part two of Article 517. It says part two of this article applies to patient care spaces in healthcare facilities. So now we need to go back a couple of pages again and figure out, well, what's a patient care space? You know, uh, if we have rules, then we need to make sure we're using the defined terms. Otherwise, we're going to get ourselves into trouble. So we look at the definition of a patient care space, and it's a space where a patient is intended to be examined or treated. Now, that's a pretty straightforward definition, I think. It's the place where the patient gets treated or examined. You know, it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, the word intended, I think, is important there as well. If you were in the waiting room of a dental office, for example, and somebody had a heart attack, they're probably going to be doing CPR and, and things on, on the patient right there in the waiting room. So we would be treating a patient in the waiting room, does that mean that that's a patient care space? No, because that's not where the patient is intended to be examined or treated. So the word intended there is kind of important. There's also an informational note that tells us that the healthcare facilities governing body is the body that designates the patient care space. So it works a little bit differently than the rest of the code, where a lot of times the onus is on the AHJ to uh, determine use and occupancy and different things. Here we're relying on the healthcare facilities governing body. Now, that could be as large as the board of directors of a hospital. It could be as small as the individual healthcare provider if you, you know, if you have a small clinic. So we really do leave it up to them. And in my opinion, that's a good thing because I was an inspector myself for a long time, but I couldn't tell you which part of a hospital or which part of a, a, a care facility needs to be considered category one, category two, category three, or category four. I'm, I'm not a doctor, right? So what's critical, basic, general, or support care or uh, support spaces? That's really not up to us to decide. That's up to the health care facilities governing body. Uh, there are four subcategories of patient care spaces, like I said, categories one through four, and that would be critical care, basic care, general care, and support spaces. 
However, we're not going to get into the differences between those because for the purposes of this discussion, it really doesn't matter. You're either in a patient care space or you are not. Let's keep reading in 517.10. So 517.10a said part two covers patient care spaces. 517.10b almost acts like an exception. It tells us that part two does not include the following items. Number one would be business offices, waiting rooms, corridors, and similar, uh, which is good. It's nice that they tell us that. But to be honest, I think the code would be the same whether that sentence existed or not, because a business office, waiting room, corridor, or similar is not a patient care space, as we talked about. Here uh, in the photograph is the waiting room of the dental office that I visit, and that's obviously not a patient care space. We're not intending to examine or treat patients in the waiting room, in the business office, in the corridors, or similar. So those aren't patient care spaces. That conversation gets a little bit more convoluted in item two, which is areas of nursing homes and limited care facilities that are used only for sleeping rooms. So is that a patient care space? Well, not if they're only used as a sleeping room. If they're also used as a room to examine and treat the patient, well, then obviously they're a patient care space. But if we have a, a retirement community, for example, I've been watching The Sopranos the last couple of days. It's not a, it's not a nursing home. It's a, it's a retirement community, mom. So <laughs> if we have a nursing home or a limited care facility, we're probably not uh, providing medical care in the individual rooms. The individual rooms are just for sleeping. And we might have a full-blown doctor's office inside the building that would be the patient care space. In the 2020 code, they made what I think is a fantastic change, a new item three that has four subsets. It clarifies that areas that are used only for intramuscular injections are not patient care spaces. This is a nice clarification. Uh, you had some people that would look at a grocery store or a drug store or even a school uh, where you can go and get vaccinations, you know, uh, for a month or whatever, a couple nights a week, they'll have vaccinations at the local high school or the Walgreens or the Walmart or the CVS. Well, if you go back to the definition of a healthcare facility, those buildings are not healthcare facilities. So we wouldn't really be reading Article 517 for those, and they're certainly not patient care spaces. However, it probably is worth making this distinction saying, look, if all you're doing is vaccines, then there's no need for any special wiring methods. Really, are, are you more vulnerable to a severe electric shock if you're sitting in a chair at Walgreens getting a flu shot? Probably not. There's no reason to have any special wiring requirements. We could say the exact same thing about psychiatry and psychotherapy, although those are definitely healthcare facilities. You remember in the definition of healthcare facility, it specifically mentions psychiatry. So those are patient care, uh, those are healthcare facilities, and the area where they're intending to treat or examine patients are indeed patient care spaces. But we have the same argument. Are you really any more electrically vulnerable to a severe shock at your psychiatrist or psychotherapist's office? Do they have patient care spaces? Sure. What kind of examination and treatment is occurring? Well, you and the doctor sit in a chair and talk to each other. Do we really need to wire that building any different than, a, than an office building? Probably not. So a really nice change here in the 2020 code. Item C is alternative medicine. It's nice to have this mentioned. You know, you could argue that chiropractic or acupuncture or acupressure, things like that, maybe that is or maybe that's not healthcare. Um, this just removes the discussion. Look, if you want to call it healthcare, fine. But this section says we don't have to follow part two of Article 517. So in the photograph, you have a chiropractor doing whatever it is that he's doing to, uh, to his patient. We would not need to wire that building with any special wiring methods. Item D is optometry, and this is a very nice clarification in the 2020 code. This is something that I dealt with as an inspector and was, and was very uncomfortable, to be honest. We had, a, uh, we had an eye doctor come in and, and, and build a suite inside of a building, and I had to figure out, okay, what exactly does this, does this physician do? And as I, as I learned, 
all that the people would do is go in there and read an eye chart and then determine whether or not they need glasses. So again, does a building like that really warrant any special wiring methods? I mean, all you're doing is standing there reading an eye chart. Well, it's definitely healthcare and it's definitely a patient care space. That's, a, that's examining a patient. But now under the 2020 code, it's very clear that an optometrist's office does not need to comply with part two, even though it is healthcare and it is a patient care space. Now, I do want to point out the subtle distinction between optometry and ophthalmology. Uh, the fact that a person specializes in dealing with people's eyes does not necessarily mean they're exempt. We exempt optometry, we do not exempt ophthalmology. So if you're going to a place that does LASIK eye surgery, for example, or cataract removals, you know, those are invasive surgical procedures and those do need to comply with part two of article 517. Now, once we get into part two of article 517, uh, perhaps the most famous section in 517 is 517.13. And uh, I had a person email me and, and said, boy, can you please really do a deep dive into 517.13? Because it's confusing for a lot of people. And uh, I was actually, uh, I thought that was a great idea. So 517.13, equipment grounding conductors for receptacles and fixed equipment in patient care spaces. It says wiring in patient care spaces must comply with 517.13a and b. Okay, before we go any farther, we need to dispel a myth. This is not redundant grounding. The term redundant grounding is not used here. You know, a lot of people have heard that term or said that term, and even I, if I'm not careful, sometimes I'll slip up and say that. But that is not what we're doing here. We're not providing any sort of redundancy. So let me tell you where, why I'm so adamant that we, that we distinguish this. I had a, doc, a, a dentist's office on the first floor of a commercial building, and they had ran the underground conduit to the dental chair, pretty much like we have here in the picture. And you know, that looks more like a doctor, but, you know, same concept. So they ran the underground to the chair, and they ran it in PVC, and they didn't get an inspection. Now... I don't freak out too much that a person didn't call for an underground inspection. I'd rather you did, but I'm not going to make you rip up concrete, you know. But I asked the guy, I said, hey, what kind of conduit is that? And he said, it's PVC. And I said, no, you're out of luck. And he says, what do you mean? And I said, it, it has to be a metal wire method. It has to be a metal wiring method. It has to comply with 517.13a. And he goes, well, for the redundant grounding, I'll just, I'll just pull two green wires. I said, no, <laughs> I don't care if you pull 20 green wires. <laughs> the issue is not redundancy. The issue is there's two different types of equipment grounds. We have the metal conduit or metal raceway itself, the wiring method. That's A. And inside of that wiring method, we have a green wire. That's B. You don't get to pick and choose or you don't get to use two options in B and none from A. You have to follow A and you have to follow B. So be very careful. The dental office chair is the one that, that is really easily violated if you're on autopilot, and it's not easy to fix. So let's take a look at what these rules say. 517.13a, wiring methods. Branch circuits serving a patient care space must be in a metal raceway or a metal sheathed cable. Okay, easy enough. So use a metal raceway, EMT, rigid, IMC. Use a metal sheathed cable, AC cable, MC cable. We could get carried away and talk about MI cable, you know, things like that. But, but let's stick to AC and, and MC cable if we're using cables. Here's the problem. The raceway or cable armor must be suitable as an equipment grounding conductor. All right, so the raceway part of that is pretty simple if we're not using a flexible raceway. So rigid metal conduit, intermediate metal conduit, EMT, these things are all recognized as equipment grounding conductors. All I would do is I would flip back to section 250.118 and I would read which type of wiring methods are suitable as an equipment grounding conductor. And I'm going to pick one of those and that's going to be my wiring method. So a non-flexible steel raceway is easy enough. I say steel, could be aluminum, you know, or red brass, uh, IMC or rigid. If I look at flexible metal conduit, that's a little bit trickier. 
I can use flexible metal conduit as the equipment grounding conductor. Now again, forget healthcare for just a minute, just in general, in general, I can use flexible metal conduit as the required equipment ground. But there are a lot of caveats. Number one, you have to use listed fittings. Okay, well, that's always required. That's required in 348.6. So listed fittings, that, that's never optional. Number two, you can't use flexible metal conduit as the equipment ground if the circuit is larger than 20 amps. So it's for 15 and 20 amp circuits only. And then we keep reading the maximum trade size is inch and a quarter. The total length of flexible metal conduit and liquid type flexible metal conduit must not exceed six feet in the same ground fault current path. And then item E, flexibility must not be needed for installation after uh, the, excuse me, flexibility is not needed after the installation for vibration or movement. So if you are using this for a light in a suspended ceiling, usually that doesn't require flexibility or vibration after the installation. You're using flexible metal conduit because it's easy during the installation. You could hard pipe to your light fixtures if you wanted to, to your luminaires. It's just easier to use flex. So the, the flexibility not needed after the installation for vibration and movement can, can get a little bit convoluted and a little bit argumentative. But when it comes to patient care space, this is pretty limiting. There's really not a lot of applications in a patient care space for flexible metal conduit. And, and by the way, if you're doing a hospital, you wanna take a, a look at 517.30 as well for the mechanical protections of the essential electrical system. So most people, when it comes to wiring health care facilities, they just stay away from flexible metal conduit. And you can say the same thing about liquid tight flexible metal conduit as well. Can you use liquid type flexible metal conduit as your required equipment grounding conductor? Sure. But just like flex, there's a lot of caveats. Listed fittings, maximum 20 amp circuit, depending on the size of the raceway. Sometimes we can go to a maximum 60 amp, again, depending on the size of the raceway. Total length not to exceed six feet. And again, flexibility not needed after installation. Now here in the photograph, this is obviously not in a patient care space but you get the idea of flexibility being necessary after the installation, the equipment's on wheels, and that's why we've got the flexible raceway. So in that application, you could not use the wiring method as the equipment grounding conductor, right? But again, this isn't a healthcare facility. So I can use rigid IMC and EMT, we know this, and then we can use flex to a, a certain extent. If we wanted to use a cable wiring method, for a long time, the, the, the most obvious choice and really the only realistic choice was AC cable. You would buy AC cable that was specifically for healthcare facilities. Now AC cable versus MC cable, you know you have AC cable when you have paper over the conductors and you have a 16 gauge aluminum strip, okay? so. That's how we know that we have AC cable. Now, what does the aluminum strip do in AC cable? That's something that I get a lot of questions about, and what do you do with that uh, 16 gauge aluminum conductor? Well, you cut it off. That's all you do. You do not have to bend it over the little red thing. You don't have to wrap it around the cable. You don't have to tie it in a knot. You certainly don't have to connect it to any screws or devices or anything else. You just cut it off. And the reason that you can cut it off is you have to understand why it's there to begin with. Why do we have this little aluminum conductor inside of that AC cable? Well, when AC cable was first manufactured, and believe it or not, all the way back in the 1890s, uh, it did not have that little aluminum strip. It only started having the aluminum strip, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it started in the 50s. And the reason they started putting the aluminum strip in is because we started to realize that the spiral interlocking metal tape, the actual cable armor, had a little bit too much resistance to consistently trip circuit breakers in the event of a ground fault. So in other words, if you were to take an energized wire and touch it to the metal jacket, the resistance was high enough that it might not trip the breaker. So how can you decrease the resistance of that cable? Well, I guess you could make the armor thicker, right? More mass would mean less resistance and trip the breaker. Or 
You could just take a small strip of aluminum and run it inside the cable jacket so that it touches the cable for the entire length. And now that little aluminum wire is in parallel with the cable jacket and it significantly decreases the impedance of the jacket. And that's why you can cut the wire off because its sole purpose in life is to touch the cable armor. You can't undo what the manufacturer has already done. I mean, short of, you know, ripping out the, the, the aluminum conductor, you can't really screw this product up. You cut it off because that little strip has already done its job. So that's what you do with it. It's the combined armor of the armor plus the aluminum strip that makes the outer jacket a suitable equipment ground. So AC cable will always have that little aluminum strip, assuming you've bought it in the last 80 years, uh, you know, it will always have that aluminum strip and it always satisfies 517.13a. We can't say that about MC cable though. MC cable, as you're probably aware, comes in a few different flavors. The traditional MC cable, the regular old spiral interlocking metal tape that we've probably all installed, is this guy here on the left. And you might be able to see it. It has a green wire. We can certainly see that. But more importantly, it does not have an aluminum conductor in it. Well, that, that poses the same problem as AC cable. That uh, metal sheath by itself is too much resistance to always trip a circuit breaker in the event of a ground fault. And that's why MC cable for decades had to have a green wire inside of it. Now, over the last 15 years or so, they've actually created different varieties of MC cable, such as the one on the right. And this is metal clad all purpose cable is what they call it. And I know you probably can't read it, but if you squint your eyes, maybe you can see that the neutral has some writing on it. It says that the armor is the equipment grounding conductor. And the reason it says that is you notice there's no green wire. And you can't see any other wires in here, but what it had is a 10 gauge aluminum conductor that just like the AC cable, you cut off and then you terminate it with the fitting. So as an inspector, you might walk up to this thing and recognize that it's, that it's MC cable because you can see the plastic instead of the paper. And you're like, holy smoke, somebody just cut the green wire out. Well, no, that's why it says right on the neutral that the armor is the equipment ground. So let's read the text here in 250.118 item 10. It says MC cable can be an equipment grounding conductor if it contains a green wire. Okay, so it's the combination of the green wire plus the armor. Or B, the combined sheath and bare conductor of interlocking metal tape. And that's what we have here on the right side of the photograph. And that can be used in a healthcare facility as far as just the armor is concerned. Item C talks about the metal sheath and, or combined sheath of smooth or corrugated tube MC cable. Now, corrugated tube and smooth MC cable are pretty rare. Um, other than, uh, other than the, the, the type that's listed for underground use or explosion proof uh, MC cable. So usually when we install MC cable, it's interlocking metal tape. It's the one on the left or it's the one on the right. And only the one on the right could be used in a healthcare facility as it relates to the cable armor. Now, as we're going to find out in a moment, the one on the right could not be used because it doesn't have a green wire inside of it as well. That's required in 517.13b. But in order to comply with 517.13a, the armor has to be suitable as an equipment grounding conductor. So traditional MC cable could not be used. Now, as with any listed product, we need to make sure that we're following the instructions. So here on the left, I've got some instructions from a uh, AC cable or AC uh, healthcare facilities or MC healthcare facilities. They've got the same instructions. It says bend the bond wire back 120 degrees and cut it with the armor. There you go. I, I wasn't lying. You really do just cut it off. Some people want to wrap it around and, you know, do all sorts of things with it. And you're certainly not required to do that. And in fact, you could make the argument that doing it would be a violation because the instructions say cut it off. Item four, select the approved MCI-A connector of correct size to ensure proper bond. 
Okay, so MC cables, uh, MC cable connectors, come in a couple of different flavors. You've got regular old MCI connectors, and that's metal clad cable interlocking metal tape, which is pretty much all of the MC cable that we use. The dash A is metal clad cable interlocking metal tape with the armor that's suitable as the equipment ground. So we need to make sure we're using fittings that are marked MCI-A, marked on the container, not necessarily marked on the, on the individual units. So make sure we're using the right connectors. Uh, boy, that would be a tough day to rough a whole building, use the right wires, and find out you gotta rip everything apart because you used the wrong connectors. So again, make sure you're following the instructions. Okay, so to reiterate, Branch circuits serving patient care spaces have to be on a metal raceway or a metal sheathed cable. And the raceway or cable armor must be suitable as an equipment grounding conductor. So that's 517.13a. If we go to the next section, B, it talks about an insulated equipment grounding conductor. And it says the equipment specified in items one through four must be connected to a green equipment grounding conductor of the wire type installed in a wiring method that complies with A. Okay, well, I have to have a special cable armor and a green wire inside of it. Now, if we look really closely, towards the back of the box, you might see a little bit of paper, which tells us that we're using AC cable. And we know all AC cable satisfies 517.13a because all AC cable has that aluminum strip. And then if you look closely, you might be able to see that they've wrapped the uh, aluminum strip around the cable. Again, not required, potentially a violation. So this installation, we know satisfies 517.13a, because it's AC cable. And we can see that there's green wires inside the cable, and that satisfies 517.13b. This is a lot of hoops to jump through, but, there's a good reason that we have to jump through these hoops. Why do we have to do this, uh, this double system of equipment grounding and equipment bonding? The reason for that is we're, we're concerned with electric shock, particularly in a healthcare facility. So the severity of a shock depends on a couple of different variables. Um, obviously, the higher the voltage, the worse the shock, right? So, so well, ultimately, the, the higher the current, the worse the shock, but the current is, is dependent on the voltage. So with everything being equal, higher voltages result in higher shocks. That's just simple Ohm's law, right? I equals E over R. So the voltage is a big determining factor in the severity of a shock. Another determining factor is the uh, frequency of the circuit. Whether we're talking 50 or 60 hertz, or 400 hertz makes a pretty substantial difference. So uh, there are some areas, there's one uh, near me by our airport where they actually, it's a government facility where they, where they manufacture equipment that they use inside of, uh, of our Air Force uh, uh, planes, our fighter planes. And they actually have a 400 hertz system. And stupid me, when I was an apprentice, uh, I got shocked working on, on the uh, 400 hertz stuff that they have and holy smokes, uh, when you get hit with 400 hertz at 120, you know it was something different. You know that was not just your regular, you know, uncomfortable, unsafe, unpleasant shock. So the voltage matters and the frequency matters, but we really can't do anything with those. I mean, look, the circuit voltage is what it is. If we need 120, we need 120. If it needs to be 208, it needs to be 208. And the frequency, <laughs> 60 hertz or, you know, it, it is what it is. One of the other factors that really affects the severity of a shock is the resistance of the path that it takes. So if I'm a, if I'm a person getting shocked, the resistance of my skin makes a big difference, and the path as well. If I'm getting shocked from hand to hand or hand to foot or you know head to foot or whatever, these things change the severity of the shock. But the skin makes a huge difference. Uh, so the thickness of the skin, you know, the very young and the very old have a little bit thinner skin, so they're more susceptible to electric shock. So the resistance matters, but regardless of your age, if you're at a hospital and you're undergoing a procedure where the skin is broken, so they've cut the skin open to do some sort of a surgery, well, if your resistance is your skin and your skin is broken open, 
boy, if you get a ground fault right to your exposed innards, uh, the game is pretty much over for you, you know? So the resistance of the body makes a big difference in the severity of the shock. But we really can't do anything about that either. You know, we, we can't change your resistance. Your resistance is what it is. We can't change the voltage. We can't change the frequency. And we can't change uh, the resistance of the circuit. What can we change? What's the fourth determinant factor? Time. How long are you getting shocked for? Obviously, the longer the shock lasts, the worse it's going to be. And that's actually something that we can somewhat control. Now, how would I decrease the duration of an electric shock? Well, you would decrease the duration of an electric shock by speeding up the amount of time it takes for the circuit breaker to open. Assuming that we have a ground fault, right? That shock is going to persist until the circuit protection device opens, a circuit breaker or fuse. How can I make a breaker or fuse open more quickly? Well, I can do that by introducing higher current. If I have a 20 amp breaker, and I put 100 amps on it, yeah, it'll trip eventually, probably take a couple of minutes. Same 20 amp breaker with 600 amps is going to trip a lot faster. But the same 20 amp breaker with 2000 amps is going to trip extremely fast. So how do we get thousands of amps to flow to make that circuit breaker trip quickly? Well, we do it by decreasing the resistance of the equipment grounding conductor. The fault current is going to travel back on the equipment ground, right? Well, if we put multiple equipment grounding conductors in parallel, we decrease the overall impedance, we increase the ground fault current, and that decreases the clearing time of the overcurrent device. It makes the shock last a shorter duration. So that's the whole intent of A and B in 517.13. So 517.13A says you need a metal conduit, a metal wiring method, uh, a metal cable that's suitable as an equipment ground, and then inside of it, we read this section, you have to have an insulated green wire for the following equipment. So which equipment has to be connected to a green wire inside of a wiring method that complies with A? The grounding terminals of all receptacles have to be connected to both. Item two, metal boxes and enclosures, such as the ones that contain the grounding terminals of the receptacle. So your four square boxes, your 1900 boxes, your switch boxes, your receptacles. Item three, surfaces of equipment operating at 100 volts or more that are likely to become energized and subject to personnel contact. So here in the picture, whatever this piece of equipment is, like I'm not a doctor, I don't know what this thing is, but I'm guessing it operates at 100 volts or more and it's likely to become energized because it's connected to a medical equipment, is it sub, or it's connected to a, to a circuit, and is that subject to personal contact? Certainly, yeah, I'm guessing at least at a minimum, the doctor is going to be moving it around. And while I said that we're trying to protect the patient, we actually are also trying to protect the physician as well. If you read the definitions in patient care spaces and you go to category one, two, and three, it actually bases the categories based on the shock risk of the patient, the visitors, and the staff. We're trying to protect all three. You know, if the doctor is touching you and gets shocked, well, <laughs> we're right back where we started, you know. So we need to protect the physicians as well. Item four is clarified in the 2020 code. Metal faceplates via their metal mounting screws. Uh, must be attached to a metal device yoke or strap. So the grounding terminals of the receptacles we know are connected to the equipment ground. What about the metal face plates? I mean, do you seriously like have to take the green wire and weld it to the face plate? Well, obviously not. And that's what we're trying to clarify here. The metal screws connecting the metal face plates to the grounding terminals satisfies the requirement in item four. There is an exception for isolated ground receptacles, however. Those can be connected to a wire type equipment grounding conductor that's not bonded to the box, although these are only allowed outside of the patient vicinity. Well, we don't want you to use isolated ground receptacles in a patient care space. Uh, and the reason for that is all, well, <laughs> the reason for that is everything we've spent the last half hour talking about, none of that matters if I put in an isolated ground receptacle. All of that goes out the window. You don't get the benefit of those parallel paths. So 
back in 2011, in fact, it was one of my proposals, uh, I made a proposal to, to outlaw isolated grounds in patient care spaces. And I was actually surprised when they agreed. Good making panel 15 looked at it and said, you know what, he's got a good point. These things do negate the whole concept of patient space grounding and bonding. Well, three years later, some people came back and said, you know what, that's true. We don't want these things everywhere in a patient care space, but there is certain equipment like computers and things that aren't gonna shock you and are far away from the patient and we really do want those on an isolated ground. So you can use isolated ground receptacles in patient care spaces, but not in the patient vicinity. And that's defined in 517.2. So we don't want IGs around the patient. The other exception, which was clarified a little bit here in 2017, exception two says luminaires that are more than seven and a half feet above the floor, as well as switches that are outside of the patient vicinity. Either of those two can be connected to wiring that complies with either 517.13a or 517.13b. Very easy to read this exception too quickly and get confused. The location of the switch and the height of the light have nothing to do with each other. They're, they're two different things. They're saying, look, if you have a switch that's outside of the patient vicinity, then that switch can be connected to wiring that complies with either A or B. So you could run EMT to your switch without a green wire going into it. That would comply with A. Or you could run regular MC cable to your switch. That would not satisfy A, but the green wire inside of it would satisfy B, right? So you could do either of those options. And in addition to that, if you have luminaires that are more than seven and a half feet above the floor, we're probably not gonna to be touching those things. So therefore I can comply with either one. I could use the metal type equipment ground or I could use the wire type equipment grounding conductor. Now previous versions before 2017 actually said that luminaires above seven and a half feet and switches that are far away need only comply with A. So they exempted B, but mandated A. So what does that mean? Well, prior to the 2017 code, your lights above the doctor's office still had to use a special cable. You couldn't use regular MC cable because regular MC cable, like here in the picture, that satisfies 517.13b. It doesn't satisfy 517.13a. So if you're in an area that's still on an older version of the code, and there's plenty that are, just note that you'll still have to use either AC cable or MC cable with a bare wire in it, or of course you could use flexible metal conduit or something like that to wire your luminaires. What you could not use is regular old MC cable. So switches that are more than, uh, that are outside of the patient vicinity and luminaires like this one that are higher than seven and a half feet need only comply with either A or B, whichever one you want. Looking at this picture, could I use that exception for this piece of equipment? No, no, it, even if that is a luminaire, and it might be, that might just be a light that moves around. It's obviously lower than seven and a half feet. So how would I wire that luminaire? I'd have to have a green wire inside of a wiring method that complies with 517.13a. All right, it's a lot to unpack in such a small section of the code, 517.13. You wouldn't think that you could read it and, and rack your brain for an hour, but boy, it can become really complex when you start trying to figure out what types of different wiring methods are allowed in a patient care space. So if you do healthcare facilities, I hope this video uh, gave you a bit of information, uh, maybe helped clarify the rules or perhaps explain the intent of why we have these rules. Uh, if you don't do patient care facilities, you know, I, to me, I always wanted to know everything I could about the electrical industry. So maybe you just wire houses, maybe you just do industrial, you know, maybe you do commercial, but you don't want to do healthcare. I think it's still worth knowing the different stuff in the code uh, that, that regulates our trade. So with that said, I hope you guys have a great day and I hope you guys are safe and we'll see you next time. Thanks for your time. Be sure to like. Follow, subscribe, and ring the bell.